Welcome everyone to this month's BJJ podcast. I am Andrew Duckworth and a warm welcome from your team here at the Bone and Joint Journal. So far this year, our podcasts have accompanied an original paper or review article we've published in the journal. We've covered a range of papers, including the management of open fractures, the use of robotic unicompartmental knee replacement. We've looked at the role and eff efficacy of DDH screening over the past few decades within the UK. And more recently, I had an excellent discussion on the role of cell therapies in orthopedic surgery. We do hope these podcasts are improving the accessibility and visibility of the studies we publish here at the journal, for both you as our readers, as well as for our many authors. As some of you may know, uh, for the months of June and July, we are doing an extra podcast to accompany our supplements from the American Hip and Knee Society closed meetings. So over the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, we'll be discussing the July supplement of the BJJ that includes 18 papers from the American Knee Society closed meeting in 2018. We hope to give you a brief overview of the Knee Society and who the members are, as well as discussing how this collaboration came about and how we hope this will benefit you as our listeners and readers. We also hope to give you a behind the scenes insight, shall we say, into how the studies within the supplement have been chosen, as well as some brief discussion on a few of the selected play papers. So firstly, I have the pleasure of being joined by our Editor-in-Chief here at the BJJ, Professor Faris Haddad. Welcome, Prof, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be with you. Prof and I are delighted to be joined by the guest editor of the Knee Supplement, it's Dr. Brian Springer, who is a, the Fellowship Director at the Ortho Carolina the Knee Centre, an Associate Professor at the Atrium Musculoskeletal Institute in the US. Welcome, Dr. Springer, and thank you again so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Faris. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. Great. So, Brian, if we could just kick off with yourself, um, if I could start with just uh, asking you to give our listeners a brief overview of the Knee Society uh, and what its role is and what your role is within the society itself. Sure, uh, thank you. So the Knee Society is a, is a very uh, exclusive group of, you know, what I would say are really thought leaders and innovators in knee disorders uh, in the United States. And now actually uh, we have several international members uh, as well. Uh, it was initially founded in 1983, really when knee replacement surgery in the, I would say in the late 70s was really just uh, in its infancy. Uh, and the, the thought process behind the, the leaders and the developers was to really allow for a, an intellectual exchange of concepts, which as you can imagine with knee replacement really just in its early stages, there were so many different types of concepts and thoughts and, and designs and, and, and the leaders had the vision to try and bring together uh, people that were really at the forefront of of knee surgery uh, to help with with innovation and really pushing this surgery uh, forward in concepts of knee and and I think that really continues today. If you look at the the mission statement of the Knee Society, it's to promote outstanding care to patients with knee disorder knee disorders through innovative research and, and education. And of course, membership is has grown uh, tremendously. We continue to have our members only meeting, which is what this supplement is about. We have uh, open meetings as well that take place at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And uh, also now just many, many educational and research platforms uh, through the society that, um, you know, really are, are continuing to push uh, knee research forward. That's a really uh, helpful overview, uh, Brian, to what the knee science does. I think it really helped the re readers to put into context, obviously the papers they're going to read in the supplement, which we'll obviously come on to. So, um, Prof, if I could just come to yourself, um, could you give us some insight in how the collaboration with the society has, has come about? Of course, it's, you know, the, the, our role at the BJJ has always been to be as international as we can be and to deliver orthopedic education around the world. And part of that is creating links and collaborations wherever we can. And part of it is ensuring that we get the best and the most up-to-date material for the journal. So I indirectly became involved with the Knee Society as one of the few international members a few years ago. So I've had some insights into the fantastic uh, work that comes through the members of the Knee Society and the, the, the quite amazing and intense discussions that happened at the, happened at the closed meeting. So when a couple of years ago, the opportunity uh, came about for the proceedings to change from its previous home to a new journal, uh, we at the BJJ felt that this was a worthwhile partnership to pursue. It uh, gives us at BJJ the opportunity to link with some of the thought leaders in knee surgery in North America and indeed internationally, because there are some international members, as you heard, uh, and 
introduce those people to the BJJ, get their material into the BJJ for now and hopefully for the future, and also broaden the appeal of the Nice Society, I think, to a certain extent by putting that material out there internationally where the BJJ has a tremendous reach. So I thought there was a real win-win and our, our board was very good in supporting that initiative. And I think Brian and I are very pleased that we've got it to the stage now where the first supplement is coming out. Yeah. I mean, is there anything you would like to add to that, Brian, at all? Or? No, I, I would, you know, I would agree with Ferris. I think these, you know, these are the exchange of ideas that happened at the closed meeting that that ultimately uh, produced these papers, I think you're going to be of a, of a tremendous benefit to the BJJ readership. And I think, you know, the benefit to the Nice Society is it just exposes it on such a greater uh, international level. Yeah, no, I, I would I totally agree. And I think the benefits to, to both, in particular, our readership is, is obviously really clear. But Prof, if I just come back to you, in terms of the individual papers which make up the supplements um, that's coming out in July, um, how were the papers chosen and, and peer reviewed prior to acceptance within the, the journal supplement itself? Okay, so this is a, a fairly complex and tiered process in the sense that papers that are presented at the closed meeting are chosen by the Educational Committee of the Nice Society, and uh, multiple papers are presented that. The opportunity is there for those who've presented to then submit their paper by December 1, uh, 2018, for consideration for this supplement. And a number of the presenters took up that opportunity. Uh, when those papers came in, they then went through a, in fact, very robust review process, which involved both the standard BJJ review process, but also involved members uh, of the North American Knee Society reviewing those papers so that we had their insights onto the papers as well. So it was a sort of dual review process, which then fed back, fed back into Dr. Springer and myself in terms of deciding uh, which papers would be accepted, uh, which needed to be revised in order to ultimately be accepted or not to the supplement, and which unfortunately did not make it. Okay, so obviously a, a very robust process, like you say, with several several tiers to it, Prof. And, and, and just coming to you, Brian, so obviously, you know, there's, I think it's probably 18 papers in the supplement. You know, is that is that a small or a medium or large selection of what's actually presented at the meeting? So it's, I think it's very representative of what's, of what's presented at the meeting. I would, you know, I, I certainly would argue that these are probably the best of the best papers because not only have the, have the larger group made it in to be presented at the closed meeting, but now those papers then subsequently are subject to this, you know, rigorous peer review process that uh, Professor Haddad just described. And unfortunately, not all make it. And I think a, 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 a tremendous amount of credit goes to uh, Professor Dowd and BJJ for for adhering to the exact same rigorous uh, peer reviewed publication standard that any other paper submitted to BJJ would be would be subjected to, and I think therefore you really get extremely high quality paper from you know I think uh, extremely high quality authors and institutions throughout the world. No, I, I totally agree, and I think it, it also reassures the readership and uh, uh, that you know the, the quality of the papers are just so high. And it's, like I say, it's a, a, almost a double tier process. So that's that's brilliant. So, if we move on to the the supplement itself, uh, Prof, I come back to you. Uh, you know, there's um, obviously a range of papers included there. But what do you feel the sort of core or topical themes are for the papers that uh, are, 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 have been presented this year? I think I'd, I'd add one more thing, and then I'll come back to that. There, yeah. there is there is there are some special papers within the supplement which are the prize papers, and those don't necessarily come from the closed meeting. There's a call for prize papers, and those have come through a, a very similar uh, sort of review process. But those, again, sort of encompass what's important, what's happening in knee surgery at the moment, which to me is, is all about optimizing the patient pathway in a number of ways. So we're, we're focusing on predicting and reducing uh, complications, be that through the use of tranexamic acid to reduce bleeding, uh, through looking at markers of glycemic control, through optimizing nutrition preoperatively, and then you know smoothing the patient journey, improving the implants, looking at what makes for a better functional outcome. And also a, a very trendy thing at the moment is reducing opiate usage and looking to see how we can manage the opioid epidemic that has resulted. So my, my impression is that these papers have really captured the breadth of knee surgery, the real focus has been on preventing problems and optimizing the patient journey. 
Yeah, no, that was certainly my impression from going through it as well. And I said, there's a few core topics there that sort of run through not just knee surgery, but orthopedics in general, through things like glycine control and opioid use. No, I totally agree. So if we if we go back to you, Brian, if, if obviously there's Prof's already alluded to the three prize or award papers in the supplement. There's the mm. two prospective studies, one looking at glycemic markers in predicting outcomes of, of, of knee replacement, another looking at the role of nutritional inter intervention for malnourished patients undergoing elective joint replacement. And then there's finally the, the RCT, which looks at the role of tranexamic acid in revision, uh, TKR. So if you could just briefly, I know we don't have, obviously have too much time, but brief overview of the three papers and why you feel that they were chosen for, for the awards. Sure. So as, as Professor Dodd mentioned, you know, there's, a, there's an open call for these, for these award papers, and they go through a very, very similar rigorous peer review process. And the, you know, the awards are, are chosen to honor the founding members of the Nice Society, John Insall, Mark Coventry, and, and Chit Ranawat. And I think they, you know, they really re represent some of, the, some of the best in current literature that's out there. As, as Ferris mentioned, we're hitting on, I think, the state of arthroplasty which win right now, which is there's such a big focus on on prevention, minimizing complications, minimizing readmission. So the 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 Insol Award paper was was unique in that it was looking at a, a a different marker for glycemic control. We have historically always used the hemoglobin A1C as a marker of a patient's glucose control, realizing that patients that have uncontrolled diabetes are at higher risk for numerous complications, including uh, infection. The challenge is, is it's a relatively insensitive marker. It can take you know, over three months to start to see a change. And that's quite a bit of time if you're a, you're a patient or a physician trying to glycemic control, but looks at it over a much, much shorter period of time. And they were able to determine essentially a, a sensitivity or a threshold where um, this particular glycemic marker was predictive of of adverse outcomes, uh, infections, complications, and, and, and credit to them was a multi-center study. They had over 1,100 patients uh, that they followed. So I, I think this is something, the nice part about this, it has something that's relatively easy, applicable to our practice, you know, almost immediately. And that's a lot of the benefit of these papers is that they can be practice changing uh, quite a bit. Um, the Coventry Award, um, was, uh, was a, a prospective randomized study looking at tranexamic acid, a medication that we've all become accustomed to using, which I would uh, say has, has no question dramatically reduced our transfusion rates among people undergoing uh, uh, elective joint replacement surgery. But there's been a lot of controversy as to what's the best way to utilize it as far as the dosing regimes. And, and various papers report different dosing regimes. But what this study does, it looks at four different dosing regimes in patients undergoing revision surgery. And essentially what they, what they show is that we know this medication works. All the dosing regimes tend to work very well. Uh, but in fact, even the lowest dosing is very effective. And so, you know, the author's recommendations of choose the lowest effective dose and those that are least cost, costly, we want, all want to be uh, health economic conscious. Uh, so I think this is very beneficial in clearing up some of the multiple um, uh, questions about ideal dosing uh, to use. A very helpful paper. And then lastly is the, the Ranawat Award paper looking at uh, something that um, I think is, is getting a lot more attention now when we talk about patient optimization. It goes along the same lines as the, as, the, as the glycemic control, and that's malnutrition. It's probably something that's under-recognized in a lot of our patients. We know it can have a negative effect. And, and essentially what this study showed was that, was that using nutritional intervention or patients that can be put on a high-protein anti-inflammatory diet appears to have some benefit in reducing their length of stay and their overall cost for treatment. So I think this paper is useful in, I think, allowing people to start to formulate some plans for hopefully being able to make some some inroads in, in being able to deal with and manage with patients that are malnourished prior to surgery. So I think all three award papers are very relevant today to clinical practice and something that, that, that the readership will be able to take and implement uh, in their practice to hopefully make changes for the better. No, that's, that's fantastic. Some of the three, thank you very much, Brian. I, I agree with you. I think particularly the last paper, the, the malnourished paper, it's, it's sort of highlighting a 
an area which obviously obviously which we'll come on to talk to in a minute you know obesity is often the thing that's talked about with knee replacements right. but actually looking at, at nutrition beforehand is a, a really uh, interesting topic i think and obviously like you say it's been touched in other specialty areas but probably something we've not looked at enough really i would say would you agree with that I would absolutely agree with that. I think it probably tends to be under-recognized, and I think it's much more prevalent than what we think it is. And I think this this paper brings that to light. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Anything you would add to that, Prof, at all? Or? No, I think it, 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 it is, uh, particularly the latter, is an area where we need to see much, much more work and where there are some big studies to do. This is really a taster for the sort of study that can happen. It, it, it's a startup. Tranexamic acid is now well-established. Fructose, I mean, we need to wait and see where that's going to end up. And uh, as with all other things, we need other centers, uh, other countries to try and validate that data in yeah. their patient populations. But the, the nutrition piece, I think, is so important. It's something you really need to hone down on methodologically. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. I think, well, just as, as I flipped that, I thought there was just one other paper I thought we discussed, obviously, with having you here, uh, Dr. Springer. I just look, looking at your perspective observational study that's in the supplement that looks at the implications of withholding joint arthroplasty in the uh, the morbidly morbidly obese patient. Um, I don't sort of thought we'd talk about this. Obviously, it's it's uh, uh, certainly a very topical this side of the pond as as well as yours. I just wanted to give us a brief oversight of the paper, what sort of made you look at it, and sort of the highlight sure. points from it. Sure. Uh, so no, thank you, thank you for uh, for bringing it up. It's uh, as you know, it's a very uh, it's a very challenging issue that that we deal with in, in both areas, certainly in the US and the UK are, you know, obesity rates are skyrocketing. We know, we know that morbid obesity has, it has implications on patients' outcomes, infection rates, complications. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky, sensitive subject because at, yet at the same time, we know that patients, even morbidly obese patients that have joint replacements uh, can, can do well and have improvements in, in their function and their quality of life. So it's a, uh, it can be a it can be a difficult subject. So, really, the impetus for the paper is that at our at our center we have always had a policy of withholding joint replacement in patients that had a body mass index greater than forty, and and ask them to try and lose weight prior to undergoing surgery because we strongly believe that there's a that there's an, a, an association or correlation with complications, but. The, the, the question was, what really happens to those patients when we tell them that they can't have surgery? And so what we elected to do is simply observe them over time and, and see what happens to them over the course of, a, of at least a two-year period of time. So we had about 289 patients that were morbidly obese that had a BMI above 40 who would have otherwise qualified for joint replacement. They had end-stage osteoarthritis. They had failed conservative treatment. And what we found over that two-year period of time is, is only about 19% of them ended up going on to have joint replacement, so a relatively low number. We didn't do any direct intervention at that time. We would, we would talk to them about going to see the bariatric uh, surgeons, and only about a quarter of those patients actually went to see the bariatric surgeon, and very few of them ended up having bariatric surgery. The interesting, the interesting part about the study is we thought, when we told these patients that they couldn't have surgery and they had to lose weight, is about a third of them uh, essentially disappeared off of our off of our radar. They they didn't come back to see us. Uh, we had a difficult time getting them to answer questions and surveys. As best as we could tell from tracking them, they weren't being seen in other uh, centers uh, from our ability to track them. And, and the ones that we did follow that didn't have surgery actually gained weight. Their BMI actually went up uh, about a point. So I think. Really, the big take-home message was this study, and what I, what we're very careful about is we're not saying that this is a dictum that you can just operate on everybody because they can't lose weight. The purpose of this study is is really to demonstrate that we need more resources, that we need more help, that these patients need more help than simply just saying, go lose 50 pounds and come back and we'll do your joint replacement, which is essentially what our policy was at that point. And so... What this has allowed us to do, and hopefully would allow other centers to do, is to establish a process and program, just like you would with any other patient that has any other medical comorbidity, diabetes, heart disease, to get them help, to help get them through this process. We think to hopefully be able to safely lose weight and be able to have joint replacement surgery. Now, the unanswered question is, does that ultimately make a difference or not in their outcomes? And that's something that we have to continue to look at. But 
we, we, we just found that the numbers to be so interesting that, that yeah. a lot of these patients just simply, simply can't do it on their own. That's, that's a, that's a brilliant overview, I think, of around the paper. And I know I'd agree. And I certainly, I know my colleagues here in, in Edinburgh, they're, they're looking at some of the things about, you know, an intervention rather than just saying, go and lose weight. How do we go and do that? Giving these people help and trying to, trying to make it a proactive thing really. And, and, and as you say, this needs to be resourced, doesn't it? Um, and I think that's, that's key to it. And, and Prof, I'll just come to you with regard to this. Obviously, it's, as I said, it's already very topical over over here. You know, what are your thoughts on it? And sort of, you know, particularly given, you know, the recent policy of some of our, our care commissioning groups of restricting access to it based on obesity. I think you've both articulated the problem really well. This is a group of patients that we need to help. You know, our role, both at an individual level to those patients and looking at healthcare systems, is to improve the health and well-being of, of our population, and our patients. And by putting barriers in place without introducing solutions, I, I think we're putting we're, we're making mistakes. The, re, the reality is there is good data that some of these patients will improve with joint arthroplasty. We just need to optimize that journey for them. And if we're going to delay or stop joint arthroplasty, we as a society, as a healthcare system, need to introduce alternative measures and put those in place. Uh, to improve and pro improve their care in primary care or secondary care before they come to joint arthroplasty. My, my view has always been that the decision to proceed with surgery or not should be one made by a patient and a surgeon together after a careful assessment. And I think the literature backs that up because a BMI uh, is not a finite figure that defines all of our patients. So uh, I think that's a great paper from Dr. Springer and his group, and it's one that will be looked at, looked at by many people and will generate more work. Yeah, that's great, brother. That's a great, great summary there. So uh, I think that's uh, that's as uh, almost done. So uh, thank you to you both for joining us, in particular, Dr. Springer. Thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, uh, discuss the supplement, and congratulations on a really e e excellent, uh, excellent papers. Thank you, Andrew. And thank thank you very much for joining us, Prof. As well. Thanks very much. Uh, so to our listeners, we do hope you've enjoyed joining us, and we encourage you to share any thoughts or comments through Twitter, Facebook, and alike. And and do feel free to post or tweet about anything we've discussed here today or on previous podcasts. And thanks again for listening in.